To gain anything from this video, you need to understand both sexual and asexual reproduction. I'll be using all of the words you see here, and I'm assuming you understand them already. If any of this is new to you, you should go back and watch the previous video that introduces all of this. As a quick recap, sexual reproduction involves two parents, each one providing a reproductive cell called a gamete, which combines with the other parent's gamete to produce a new, unique cell called a zygote, which can divide and develop into a complete organism. Asexual reproduction, on the other hand, requires only one parent, and all the offspring are genetic clones of that parent. Amongst plants, animals, fungi and protoctists, you will find examples of species that can reproduce either sexually or asexually, and many that can do both. All species of bacteria and archaea, however, can only reproduce asexually. Here, we're focusing on the advantages of each type of reproduction. Sexual reproduction has the advantage of providing genetic variation within a population, and so the populations are more likely to survive in changing environments. Asexual reproduction is more time efficient, it requires less energy, and doesn't rely on an individual being able to find a mate, meaning populations can grow quickly and survive if the environment is stable. This video will describe and explain the relevance of these ideas. Let's start with the genetic variation that arises from sexual reproduction. Like all cells, gametes contain DNA. Whether we're talking about egg and sperm cells from animals, or the gametes found in pollen and ovules in flowering plants, they all contain the parent organism's DNA. DNA is the genetic information that codes for the features of a living organism. How tall a plant is, the shape of a fish's fins, the strong muscles in a lion's legs, most features are determined, at least in part, by an organism's DNA. When these DNA-containing gametes fuse during fertilization, the DNA of each parent is combined in the zygote. You may think that this would result in the offspring having double the amount of DNA, because they now have their father's DNA plus their mother's DNA. But that's not correct. In fact, in order for the new organism to have the correct amount of DNA, each gamete contains a random half of the DNA of the parent. When these two halves combine, they provide one complete set of DNA in the new cell, which then divides and develops into a new individual. Exactly which bits of the DNA make up the half portion within each gamete is quite random. If we compare the DNA in two egg cells from the same female, they would each have a different combination of DNA. No two egg cells provided by one female contain the same DNA. No two sperm cells provided by one male contain the same DNA. Each gamete is genetically unique. So, if the same two parents have more than one child, each one will be genetically unique. There is zero possibility that two separate instances of fertilization will produce two children that are genetically identical. No two sisters contain exactly the same DNA. No two brothers contain exactly the same DNA. Obviously, you're thinking, what about identical twins? This happens when an egg and sperm cell form a single zygote in a single instance of fertilization. Early in development, the newly forming collection of cells divides into two. Each collection of cells goes on to form two genetically identical individuals. This is a rare occurrence, and it doesn't change the fact that sexual reproduction produces lots of genetically unique individuals. In sexual reproduction, new generations are produced from multiple sets of parents, each offering unique combinations of DNA. All individuals in the new generation will be genetically unique from each other and from their parents. I'll say it again, sexual reproduction produces lots of genetically unique individuals. This is true for every type of organism that reproduces using sexual reproduction. A flowering plant population, for example, will also have genetic variation if reproducing sexually. So what, you might ask? Well, imagine the conditions in the environment change. 
Let's say these plants live in a location where the winter temperature reaches as low as 5 degrees Celsius. This population is used to that and most of these plants can survive a minimum temperature of 5 degrees. But remember that none of these individuals are the same. They're all genetically unique. Maybe some of them have the genetic instructions that provide features that allow them to survive at lower temperatures. There may be some that can only survive at higher minimum temperatures, and these individuals are unlikely to survive even an average winter. But now let's say there is a particularly cold season and the temperature drops to 2 degrees Celsius, below what this species is used to. The cold temperatures may kill off many of the individuals, but since all of these individuals are unique, some can survive these colder conditions. As a result of genetic variation, the population is more likely to survive. Notice that genetic variation does not necessarily make each individual more likely to survive changing conditions. It makes the population as a whole more likely to survive. Changing climate, changing food supplies, diseases, the introduction of new predators are all examples of possible changes in the environment that a population may need to be prepared for. Looking at asexual reproduction, remember that each individual produced from a single parent is a genetic clone of the parent. If this population of plants were produced from a single individual via asexual reproduction, they would all be equally at risk of environmental changes. This population is less resistant to environmental change because any change in conditions that kills one individual is more likely to kill all of them. But asexual reproduction is not all bad. Firstly, for sexual reproduction to happen, individuals need to find a mate. Male and female animals must find each other and mate, and sometimes complicated mating rituals are involved. In addition, gametes must be produced in order for fertilization to take place. In the case of flowering plants, the plants obviously must produce flowers, sometimes with large colorful petals and nectar to attract insects. Again, just like in animals, gametes must also be produced. And don't forget fruit and seed development. All of this takes time and energy. In general, the time taken to produce mature offspring via asexual reproduction is much shorter than when using sexual reproduction. So, asexual reproduction is a better way of colonizing an area quickly, assuming conditions are right. So just to reiterate the main points, sexual reproduction has the advantage of providing genetic variation within a population, and so the populations are more likely to survive in changing environments. Asexual reproduction is more time efficient. It requires less energy and doesn't rely on finding a mate, meaning populations can grow quickly and survive if the environment is stable. <laughs>